without further ado, I want to turn it over to Dr. George Cope. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I thought Jeremy was my friend, and then he gives me the last presentation. So you're already in overload, right? You've, you're already in overload. You've had lunch, so you're, you, all of the sugar levels are changing, and uh, it's time. So you're ready to go uh, in the process, but uh, I'm still looking forward to our time. Um, a little engagement, because I think that We've heard about communication. We've heard a lot of different kinds of concepts about soul care. So I just want you to encourage those that have spoken. So um, for those that were in Joe's class, what would be a takeaway that you're going to take away from what he presented in his presentation that is stuck into your th thinking right now that you're going to walk away with a takeaway? This I'm not going to forget. Who was in Joe's? Who, yes, sir. Spending time unscripted, just being with a team, living it out. Okay. Yes, doctor. Put your phones up when you talk. All right. So get rid of them. All right. So super. All right. So that was Joe. Pete, who was in Pete's uh, 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 presentation. What was your takeaway? Great. Someone else? Yes? Leadership is also defined in moments. Leadership is defined in moments. Good. Great. Okay, Dawn. Yes? You can increase 35% of your brain with appreciation. Is that, is that a statement? So we're making stated appreciations. Right? Beautiful. One other person for Dawn. Yes? That joy is a skill that can be taught. Joy is a skill that can be taught. All right. Fine. Last but not least, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jeremy, what, what was the takeaway from the opening plenary session? Thrive. Everybody. What's that? Thrive. Thrive. All right. And, uh, we'll, okay, great. So, and, yes? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, David. Please forgive me. Uh, forgive me. So David outing. Yes. It's okay for leaders to admit when they're not okay. All right. One more. Ask for help. All right. So uh, the good news is that for the previous speakers, everybody was listening. And uh, you know, that's, I mean, that's valuable information. That's really important. So I, I think it's good that we, we reiterate and uh, create some takeaways for ourselves in the, in the midst of it. Well, uh, notice that I'm the only one with a bow tie. So that means that I am the smartest guy in the room, right? No, 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 that's not true. Um, uh, the, the reality is my mother taught me a lesson when I was a kid. She said, son, you may not know much, but try to look like you do. So I'm just trying to, just trying to look the prof position here in the midst of it. it, 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 it's, it, it really is a, a privilege to... Uh, to focus together in terms of, um, of leadership and, and specifically servant leadership because uh, it has such um, powerful impact that we'll try to bring a summation to the midst of this. So here's what I want you to do with me, okay? So what's that number? Okay, so I want you to count with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Stop. Within seven seconds of meeting someone, no matter who you meet, you have already drawn assumptions of that individual. Within seven seconds. So when those speakers walked up to the uh, to front of the class, within seven seconds, you were, you were drawing assumptions about them. You looked at them, and uh, I would assume that maybe some of the assumptions that you have of me is, well, he seems to look the part. He may know something. Maybe one of the assumptions is, well, he's old. He doesn't have any hair. Maybe that uh, the result is that he's been a good leader, but he's lost his hair along the way. I don't know. I, I don't know what your assumptions of me are, but we all draw assumptions. And so the reality is, is that we're living in a world where we are, we are constantly dealing with 
this idea of what people are thinking and feeling. And by the way, assumptions are not all wrong. The problem with assumptions, though, is when you believe them before you find out all of the information that needs to be known in drawing those assumptions. So we look at people and we draw the assumption and oftentimes we stop there without understanding the power of what it was that that person is about and really understands. You drew an assumption of me. So would anybody, would anybody dare to risk, I mean, we talked about being honest and vulnerable. Would you, would you dare, anybody dare to give me the assumption in the first seven seconds of me standing up here? Yes. I thought you were one of a lot of wisdom. One of wisdom, okay, thank you. Bless you, I'll pay you after the meal. Somebody else? Yes? My assumption is that it was going to be good. Yeah, okay. Well, that's yet to be determined, right? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I actually didn't assume. You didn't assume? Because I do this a lot, so I just didn't even think. Okay. One other person? Anybody want to take a chance? It's okay. I, I'll love you anyway. Yes. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. All right. <laughs> Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Would you be my neighbor? Right. <clears throat> well, uh, let me just sort of tell you my story, okay? Um, I am 67. I was born in a minister's home. Maybe that's a disclaimer because all of us that are speaking come from different backgrounds. I, was, I come from a pastoral background, so I've spent 45 years I pastored churches for 38. I was a college president for six years. And, uh, and so now I serve five and a half years in Vision Orlando as, as a pastoral director in our city. So I have varied backgrounds, but my, my whole life has been tempered in growing up in a, uh, in a minister's home. Um, uh, I have a sister that's three and a half years older than I am, and my sister was, uh, is uh, still very smart. She graduated from high school when she was 15. She was in college full-time when she was 16, and uh, she was just quite bright. But I failed kindergarten. <laughs> it's the truth. And um, I couldn't count to 10 at the end of, of my kindergarten years, and so they ran me back through. And at the end of the second year, my father moves from Tennessee to Alabama. They put me in the first grade, and I proceed to fail. And so I... Um, I went through all of my public school and never made a passing grade. I, I went to college and I married at the end of my freshman year my wife who was a straight A student because I was about to flunk out of college and she got me through college. Now have your perceptions of me changed a little bit? I'm a dyslexic kid. So I have, I have all the classic and I share that with you only as the idea of uh, in, in the drawing of assumptions and the kinds of things, we tend to look at oftentimes the wrong things uh, and assuming with people. I do have an earned doctorate degree. I have a master's degree. Interestingly, later on in my life, God asked me to go back to school. The one thing that I told God I would never do again when I got out of college was ever go back for education. Because the first two times I got through once because I was just a good kid, they didn't know what to do with me and they passed me through high school. The second because my wife did a great job of helping me study to get out of Bible school. But thirdly, the reality is, is that when God called me again, God can take and he can do amazing things in people whose lives understand the intention of purpose. If we don't know our purpose, then life is lived at a level of, uh, of inadequate competencies that we need to deal with in the process. And so the result of that is that things change. When I was 13, my life changed because I went to a, a, a summer camp for teenagers, and it was on a Wednesday night that I had an encounter with a living God who simply said, George Cope, I want you to be a pastor. And when I realized that that was God, and that's a, a, a long story, I said to that voice, how can I be a pastor? I cannot read or write. There was an honesty to that. And there was, there was just a realization back in my spirit, I can take care of that. 
That set the trajectory of my life and my purpose that I have never been the same as a result of that. And so I've spent 45 years doing something that a lot of people thought I could not do. In fact, I had my second grade teacher tell my mother in my own presence, I heard her say, put George in a school for the mentally retarded. <laughs> my mother said he may be slow, but he's not retarded. Exactly. I had an advocate. And from that day forward, my mother would say to me, George, I, I don't fully understand you, but God doesn't make junk, and God has a wonderful plan for your life. My mother was my salvation in the midst of it. And then just the realization that God can take people like us. It's just like God to take a dyslexic kid and make him a college president. It's just like God to take people who understand when they say yes to gifts and abilities and the and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that God can do things with us that we could never do for ourselves or train ourselves to do because there is a power that trumps humanity and it is the work of God in the hearts and lives of individuals. Now that's my pastoral background in the midst of it. But I, I, I really want you to know that we need to be careful in this assumptions. I tell you that, all of that, because I want you to realize that we, we need to uh, understand that assumptions can be damaging and it can lead when we make assumptions that are not accurate it leads to mistrust poor communication and damaged relationships I want to talk a little bit later about how to dispel assumptions but I, I I really want you to understand what it was that changed my life uh, the, the the reality is the, the number one question people always seem to ask me is, George, how did I learn? How did it change? What was the change? And I will suggest to you there are two answers that always come out when that question is asked. I learned to speak by listening to other people's words. Literally, when I walked into a room, I could not, I didn't know a verb from a noun, I didn't know where to punctuate, I didn't know any of that, but when I walked into a room, I observed people that they had a sense of confidence and understanding, and I would slide around, I was the proverbial wallflower, I'd walk around the room until I saw them in their animation or their conversation, I would get close enough and I wouldn't look at them because I didn't want them to know I, but I turned my ear toward them and I listened to their words, the power Power of words. I suggest to you, as we heard from Joe earlier, words matter. Words taught me how to put. Still to this day, I can't explain anything other than I just listened to people who were articulate, people who were positive, people that were impactful, and their words changed my life. I suggest to you that as a servant leader, the most powerful tool that you will ever have in your arsenal of leadership skill is the ability to speak words. God created this earth. He spoke it into existence. The only thing he made was man. He took the dust and he made us, but everything else he spoke, the power of words. The second thing that I think is important, write this down, it's words, you're, you're going to walk out of here with anything. You're going to walk out of here with the power of your words. And the second thing is the power of presence. We've heard some of these things already stated today. But the reality is, how did I learn? It was because there were people in my life who were willing to engage me. There were those that believed in me that said, George, let's ride together. Let's talk together. Most of my leadership training was not in an academic environment like this, but in a car or in a building, in a place, in an office where people took me and asking questions and responding because the power of presence changed my life. People believed in me. When they didn't understand me, they still believed in me. A very quick story, uh, my, my, the only teacher that ever spoke a word of encouragement to me was my 12th grade homeroom teacher. And it was in 1970, it was in April, that at the end of a class she turned, or she asked me at the end of the class, the homeroom was the last period, to stay. And she sat down and looked at me and she said, George, I don't understand you, I failed you as a teacher, I don't know how to help, but I just want you to know this. I believe you're going to make it someday. 
her presence. I, I, I must confess that I've never forgotten Mrs. Rayleigh. And so fast forward my life now, I'm in my 40s, I've earned my doctor degree. The one person I wanted to share that with, so I wrote a letter to Mrs. Rayley, called the school that I graduated from, said, is she still a teacher? No, she's not. Uh, is she alive? Yes. I'd like to send her a letter. They said, send it, we'll get it to her. I haven't seen that lady since 1970. And on Thanksgiving weekend, I preached in a church in Columbus, Georgia, where I graduated from high school, and she was sitting in the building. And I had the opportunity to thank her for presence. That present, that one brief moment, she didn't really say anything powerful to me when she said, I don't understand you, I failed you, but I believe in you. Presence, 50 years almost of memory not lost in the midst of that. Remember, seven seconds can change not only your life, but it can change somebody else's life when you recognize that. The two greatest competencies are words and presence. But my, my, my allotted time is simply what servant leaders look like in a self-serving world. And, and I, I'd like to stay true to that and be very, very brief. I'm going to do my very best to, uh, to help you. Robert Greenleaf is the, uh, he is the creator, the founder of servant leadership as a concept. It was, it was coined in 1970. And so he defines in his own words, the servant leader, let's say it together. The servant leader is a servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. That was Greenleaf's definition of what servant leadership is about. It, it, it's simply understood. We would simply, hearing the term servant leadership, we would think that it would have a divine connection, but the facts were that Greenleaf was an atheist. Greenleaf stole servant leadership from the Bible, but never would acknowledge it. Uh, Greenleaf uses Jesus in, as a model of servant leadership in the text, uh, in his text, in writing his uh, theory of servant leadership and its practices in the midst of it. But the one thing that I would, would say is this. Most people don't know that servant leadership from 1970 to 2007 got no traction in America. It was very, very limited. Only in recent years, in fact, it really took hold in 2008. Anybody remember what happened in 2008? The, the recession, right. What was going on during the, the, the housing recession? That was when Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae collapsed. All the banks were going, you know, they were bailing them out. And in the midst of it, what surfaced was leadership in America in 2008 was all about the leader serving himself. The self-interest of leadership. And when that happened, Greenleaf, it has exploded servant leadership in the marketplace because what it's done is that it's flipped it. The focus is not on the leader, it is on the, the people, the ones that are being served. Leaders understanding that in the midst of it. it, here's, it this is an interesting, just sort of a biblical point of view because Jesus shows us the reality of that in John chapter 13 where he makes these statements. He said, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Anybody knows what happens next? That's when he takes off his robe, puts on, you know, the outer, or, uh, ties a, a robe around him or a, a, a scarf, and he washes the disciples' feet. That is the major realization of how Jesus showed. But this is interesting. How did Jesus learn servant leadership? By obedience. That's true. But let me just give you a little piece of Jewish history, okay? So we go back to Jewish cultural history. Sons were evaluated about their potential as being a rabbi. Every son would love to have been a rabbi growing up in the days of Jesus. But they were evaluated. They were evaluated at the young age, and, 
and all the way through until they were 12. And at the age of 12, if they did not have the Pentateuch memorized or have the capacity to memorize the Pentateuch, they would never be engaging as a rabbi, a teacher, because that was, that was one of the qualifications. You had to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? So if a son, if a son was going to not follow in his father's footsteps, notice not follow in his father's footsteps, as Jesus at the age of 12, when his mother and father found him in the temple, the question was, where have you been? And Jesus' response was, I must be about my father's business. Jesus was declaring to Joseph, I'm not following the family business. Carpentry. Really was a stonemason because they didn't have a lot of wood back then. So what Jesus was saying is, I'm not going to do what you did, Dad, but here's what Jewish custom says. If you're not following your father's profession, you have to give the first 30 years of your life to your father and his business. When did Jesus start his ministry? When he was 30. Jesus learned to serve his father out of Jewish culture. What's my point? My point is this. I told you my story. I tell you that story because servant leadership is not a theory per se of Robert Greenleaf. Servant leadership is an adaptable spiritual application of life. And one of the problems with academia is, is that academia can give you all of the, the, the qualified reasons and theories of anything, but we can't make you do it. There has to be an encounter with a God and a realization that what is important to God must become important to us because Jesus did not come to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life. Jesus was born. Jesus lived. Jesus demonstrated. When Jesus in John 13 takes off his outer robe and then puts on an apron and he washes the disciples' feet, that was not something that he thought up in that moment. How will I show them? That was the concept of Jesus' life. He was a servant leader in and out. It flowed out of him. And therefore, what I would suggest to us is that we've got to be careful that if we choose this leadership uh, concept, we have to be people who sense an authenticity of that, or it will quickly be recognized as only theory. And we don't want to be theorists, we want to be practitioners. That's why you're in this room, to be a practitioner in the process has everything to do with leadership. Did you know 75% of people leave an organization not because of the job, but because of their boss? Yeah. It's because of the person doing the leading. The reality is, is that that's the challenge, is that jobs are not, people will work because we all know that's part of life, but they want to work in a place where they have a boss who has a whole different, and 75% do that as a result. 87% of workers worldwide based on a Gallup poll, think of their jobs more in terms of frustration rather than fulfillment. Worldwide, 87% of people, which tells us a lot about the environment that bosses are creating for people that are making them frustrated. We spend 60% of our lives working or preparing to work. And therefore, when you realize those previous two statistics, then that's pretty challenging that the majority of our life is lived, people are living their life in frustration or they're dealing with problem bosses that make their life unfulfilled. So what, what are we trying to say? It means everything as it relates to then the whole concept of, um, of 
working in the proper way to get our lives in, in the process. And so um, I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said. We've just finished Black History Month and we've heard a lot of his quotes and that, but he makes this statement. Everybody can be a leader because everybody can serve. Everybody can be a leader because everybody can serve. So the very first question we need to deal with is how do you measure the success of being a leader? And success prior to the market crash in 2008, before we get to uh, servant leadership, it, it was money. Success always seems to be associated with position. And let me suggest though today, very quickly, and I'll have you out of here before 1.30, is that success, that your greatest success is the creation of a better version of yourself. And that's what I want to help you to know today in this idea. How do you create a better version of yourself so that statistically, whether you're in the church, you're in the marketplace, it doesn't matter in your home, whatever the situation might be, what is it that will make you a better version of yourself that these kinds of things will not be spoken of you? So I'd like to suggest to you just a, a few things that need to be done. Number one, stop. Stop. Take a pause. Some of these things are, again, a bit of reflection what uh, Dr. Jeremy shared in his first session. But, but I want you to understand that in the midst of leadership, the one thing that we are not doing a great job of is pausing because pause is a powerful tool that we can use that keeps us from reacting to responding. People need to pause or stop so that we don't react, we respond to people. We can listen to what is not being said. And doing that effectively always leads to trust. So the question is, how do we get people to trust us? We need to stop in the midst of conversation. We need to listen. We need to understand what it is that's going on in our lives and our situation. My first job out of college, I was a youth pastor. I found out, being a youth pastor, that I hate teenagers. <laughs> it's a tr true story. You know, I love old people, but teenagers were a problem to me. That's another story. But um, I was a youth pastor, and uh, I had my own set of frustrations because I found out I was, I was this obedient kid that always tried to do everything. You know, I was just trying to please and, and get through life. But, but I was dealing with young people that had no concern for what I thought or felt in the process. And so I was feeling this deep sense of inadequacy. And I had a, a German pastor that I worked for. His name was Darwin Heiser. And uh, Darwin had this, it, it just seemed like it always happened every day. It was his office. It was his son's office who was the educational pastor. It was my office. And about every hour, Darwin seemed to would get up out of his chair and he wanted to go for a walk. And he would walk down the hall and when he would get to my door, he seemed to pause and he would just simply belt out, God help us. <laughs> I mean, and, and after about... You know, I mean, this is, I was two and a half years then. I mean, this happened every day. He would get to my door. It was like he paused and he would go, God help us. Like I'm the problem in the midst of it, right? I, I mean, I got fed up in the midst of that. And, and one day I was so upset. He had this little philosophy is that uh, if somebody went to the altar on a Sunday night, he never left the altar until the last person had gotten up and left. And I was going to put him to the test. When I got up, there was no one, nobody in the building, and he stayed. So when, when I get up, he looks at me and he goes, so George, what kept you at the altar so long? And I said, you did. <laughs> and I told him about this God help me kind of a thing. And um, in that process, he, he had... He, he then admitted the fact that that was never his intention to stand there and intimidate with me, and, and I had never stopped him to listen to understand what he was feeling, and he never took the time to listen to what I was feeling. And as a result is when we settled that kind of thing, we found a relationship that, would, that, that was meaningful and life-changing in the midst of it. But we had to stop. 
I think that what happens with too many leaders is that we just keep trucking. We just keep moving. We never take the time to stop. May I suggest that one of the greatest ways that you can be a servant leader is to walk through your offices, walk to your people, uh, wherever it is in ministry, show up in a Sunday school class, show up in the choir room, show up places where there you can just stop and allow for the engagement of people in your life because servant leaders, if they don't stop, they will never have the capacity to be able to grasp, understand the power of the people that you're, you're working with. Second thing I would suggest, value individuality. You know what the, the number one problem with leaders are when they don't recognize individuality? What would you think their number one problem would be? How do they hire? Just like themselves. Just like themselves. And that's what they're looking for. But the facts are, and you can go into the studies, that you, when you get people that are diverse from you, you get a better uh, sense of productivity, of relationship, of growth and development. But if you're always hiring just like yourself, but this is a terribly difficult challenge for a lot of leaders because they see individuality as something that they are not comfortable with. You can make someone feel essential, and that is the key in individuality. Servant leaders create the atmosphere in a workplace where people can come in and be who are, they were meant to be without feeling intimidated or understanding. We have to give people that flexibility to be themselves and bring the value of their insights, their giftings, and their talents to the table. People that want other people to just be like themselves are people that will never allow the future to, e to emerge in a much different way. Again, uh, that same pastor, uh, he wanted me. He thought I was going to be a lot like him. And um, he, he required me to have our youth service one hour before Sunday night. Now, you guys probably don't even remember, but there was a day when we went to church on Sunday night. <laughs> it, 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 it did happen. And so we would go one hour before church on Sunday night. We had a youth service, and we never had more than 12 kids. And for a year and a half, I, I began to say to him, I have a vision to grow this youth group. And that was his thing. Why can't you get young people to come out? And I would always say, an hour before church, they're going to sit with me, and then they're going to sit through you. That's not going to happen. And he just fought it, fought it, fought it. And one day I came in and I said, Pastor, please, just give me a chance. And this was the turning point. I said, if it doesn't work, we'll go back the way it was. And he said, okay, let's try it. So I said, Thursday night, we're going to do it. And so we announced it, we did the preparation, and the reality was is that uh, we started w youth on Thursday night, and within 90 days we had 100 coming, not 12. But he had to give me the expression of individuality. He had to allow, I couldn't be what he was in that environment. And so when you, if you trust an employee enough to hire them, trust them enough to allow the creativity of what they bring to the table because you never know, they may be the solution to what you're looking for that you would never ever in your personality or style ever attempt. It comes to individuality. Praise and acknowledgement. These are things that we've heard. Uh, but the power of praise. I, I just want to, because of time, I just want to give you a highlight. Uh, the president of Campbell Soup to date has written 30,000 thank you notes to his employees. 30,000 thank you notes. And it's not just thank you for working at Campbell's Soup. It was the president, the CEO knows the people and said, thank you for working on this project. Thank you. How is your kids doing? 30,000. The power of praise is a, a, it's an incredible thing. I learned it afresh and anew the other day. I, I, uh, I exercise and do a class uh, three days a week. And, uh, 
I, and I was, you know, I, I'm at my age, the, the closest person in my class is like 20 years younger than I am. And so I, uh, I'm, I'm never the top performer if you get my drift, right? I'm not the strongest, the fastest, and all of that in the class. But the other day, the, the, the coach walked by, and he looked at what I was doing, and he said, great job, George. The adrenaline shot through my body like I've never been on cocaine, but if that was the feeling, I can understand. I mean, it was like, I'm going to take the mountain. You know, kind of, it was just that simple comment of affirmation to me changed my, I was tired, I was sweating, I wanted to quit. But when he affirmed me, it was like we had not started the class yet. Servant leaders have this capacity. Let me just simply suggest to you that your number one job as a servant leader is to create vision, the big picture, create big picture and an environment where that, that vision can unfold. But I suggest that the second greatest job that you have as a servant leader is that of affirming and praising people. Because when people are recognized and appreciated, they'll break their back for you. Because all people want is to know they are valued, they are recognized, they are appreciated within the environment of what's taking place. Now, I know that there's a little phrase here, but uh, let me suggest that servant leaders seek to understand. The, the, Joe, I think that the problem with, le with, with communication, you said in the class this morning, you said, what's the greatest uh, or what is uh, some of the forms of communication? And you didn't hear me, but I said listening. I think listening is probably the greatest form of communication because we are so quick and every leader, society has taught leaders that you must have answers. Right? In fact, how many times have you been in an environment where you felt like somebody came to you and asked you a question or they, they had a problem or concern and they were expecting you to solve that and you did not have the guts to say, you know, I don't know. We come up with answers because in the process, what we fail to understand is the power of seeking to understand. Seek to understand, then you'll be understood, but you got to seek to understand. The power of servant leaders is that they have created, again, the environment where people can come and in their, uh, in their conversation, that they understand us as one who wants to understand them and the issues that are there. And it requires us to listen and speak much later. I've learned to say as a, as a pastor, I had a staff at Calvary here. We had 123 employees at our church. Um, and so I understand what it's like at the college. I had a few more than that. I, I've, I've led whether the staff is huge or small. What I've understood though, is that I, I got to the place where I would listen to people and rather than even trying to respond, to ask them to give me the privilege of prayerfully considering and pondering what they said before I got back to them with the information, unless it was an emergency, of course, because I wanted to understand. And oftentimes I had to ask questions. And many times I was answering questions on the basis of assumptions that were not accurate. It's the only way of seeking to understand. Oh, I don't know what that did. What happened, Martha? Come on, Martha, you're the, you're the skilled person here. Forgive me. Oh, you can't do that. Let me go this again. Sorry. See, you just found out I wasn't perfect. Um, let me understand, um, or let us uh, look at empowerment just for a moment. Servant leaders know the power of empowerment. People want to be creative, but they don't want you to do it, or they don't want to do it the way you want them to do it. And so the power of servant leadership is to empower people to do the job. How many of you have been on a staff where individuals told you how to do your job, okay? How did you feel? Stifled. Stifled? You didn't feel that, did you? What's that? 
Yeah, leave your brain at the door and just do what we say. So it's the machinery kind of concept. Empowerment is, is something that, again, is, it, it's assumed in leadership, but it clearly is squashed in most places where people do not value human potential. You see, in the early, I said words. I, people taught me how to speak by listening to words and then presence. The, this, this is where I found the greatest sense of my development is that people saw in me potential and they, allowed, they empowered me with the opportunity to do the work. I failed in some of those opportunities, but it was out of my failures that I learned. And those people that had hired me or those people that were working with me allow me to be human. We don't allow ourselves to be human at times. Empowerment doesn't mean perfection. Empowerment means that we give people potential to live out. I have potential in a ways and abilities that, that no one could scholastically evaluate when I was growing up. I just needed to be put in a school for the mentally retarded. That's how they were gonna deal with me. They didn't see that I had a brain and potential and I could do things that were not on their radar screen or charting system. Just to show you again, empowerment. And it, it, there was a day uh, in my fourth grade, it was toward the end, it was in the month of May, it was getting ready to end that school year. And my fourth grade teacher asked us to take out a pencil and she was gonna give us a test. So she passed them out and as she said, when she said the word begin, uh, she said, George, would you come up here? And I thought, oh, this is amazing. I don't have to take this test. So I go to her desk and I'm standing at her desk and she begins to ask me a series of questions of which I gave her all the answers. She looked at me at the end of those questions and she said, George, you just passed this test. But because I couldn't write it down, she gave me a zero. And she didn't tell my fifth grade teacher that if you audibly talk to George, he's got the answers. She took my empowerment away. She took my individuality away. She stifled my ability to, to, to move forward. She did not, I walked away thinking, man, that's, that's the first time I've ever done anything like, she never said good job. She just simply said, you answered all the questions and proceeded when I got my paper back to put a zero on it. You've got to understand that when you empower people, you empower people to find their potential. And when they find their potential, you celebrate that with them, even when it doesn't look like the way you do it. Transparency. Here's one. We, uh, it, it was assumed in somebody's conversation this morning, but... Uh, this is the thing that servant leaders really, uh, I think, have to capitalize on in the midst of, of their leadership style. They have to allow for a safe environment for others to be transparent with them because servant leaders understand this one question uh, that creates the greatest sense of transparency, and that is, how can I help? How can I serve you? What can I do to make this task easier or better. That is what creates, I think, greater transparency in servant leadership in the style in which we're doing and, and seeking to lead in the day in which people are not wanting leaders that focus on themselves, but leaders that focus on humanity and what it is in humanity that makes the difference in their lives. Being transparent. We have to learn to be comfortable in vulnerability. Bill Hybels said, everyone wins when a leader gets better. And so how do we get better? You've got to make the decision in the midst of being in this and these workshops today. How are you going to live out the concepts that you learned from Joe and Pete and David and, and um, Dawn, forgive me, Dawn, and Jeremy and myself? Are you going to fill people up with genuine praise? Are you, uh, are you going to be authentic and transparent? Are you going to ask great questions and seek 
to understand? Is there going to be transparency? I think that the great question in the midst of all of this day is this. You lead the most important person in the world, yourself. You are the most important person in the midst of it. You know, we, again, we may have concerns about our jobs, our business, our, where we are. You may be in this as advancing your educational responsibilities for the job that you have to get a promotion or a pay raise or whatever. But the reality is you can do this all you want, but if you don't understand that the greatest person in the world that you are leading is yourself and that you're not going to create the environment for that to happen, you will never, ever develop and become what the world is looking for. I lived my, again, my life with the sense of people assuming that I had nothing to offer. Nothing to offer. I, I can't tell you how many teachers told me that I was stupid or dumb. I literally heard that from the people teaching me. But let me suggest that I think that there are a lot of employees that are not hearing it in words every day on the job, but they're hearing it through actions. Mm -hmm. You're stupid. You're dumb. I look back at my life and I think people will often say, you know, if you had it to do over again, what would you, would you want a different way to live? And the answer to that question is no. If I had my life to, give, to live over again, I would ask God to make me dyslexic again because my dyslexia has shaped my servant heart. Because when I walked on the platform on a Sunday morning, I didn't think about the numbers of people or the offering or the building. I thought about people just like myself, broken and hurting that needed to be affirmed and encouraged and strengthened. That was the essence of my ministry. I, I step into a classroom. I, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box. I'm not the brightest color in the, in the chalk box. But I've learned some things about life and, and, and leadership, and that is this, that if Jesus thought it was important to do this with humanity, if, if Jesus demonstrated it, if Jesus was able to change the world because of a simple act of washing people's feet and he's saying to his disciples, you go do the same, then the reality is, is that servant leadership is a quality that has to be spiritually birthed in human heart. And so my prayer for you today is that again, you will not just have heard through each of our speakers theory, but that you will desire a transformed inner self that says, God, if that's the way you change the world, then help me change my family, my job, my church, my Sunday school class, Whatever I'm doing, help me to do that by grasping the fact that there's nothing wrong with loving and serving because the kingdom of God is built in that capacity. Whatever, um, I, I, I wish I'd have brought one more slide and I'm done. If I'd have brought one more slide, I would have taken you to a cemetery. And I would have shown you a tombstone because I have determined what I want my epitaph to read. Have you? Clearly, I've already told my wife, this is my epitaph. He loved God and people, and they knew it. I would ask you, wherever you're at in leadership, servant leaders are people who when they are through with their leadership and impact, people knew they were loved. They knew they were appreciated. They knew they were valuable. They were not a commodity. They were a prize to be cherished. That's what God asked us to do as we go be his salt and his light 
in a broken and a damaged culture. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord's face smile upon you, and may he give you the capacity to be a servant leader in a world that does not understand its concept. May your words and your presence be the most valuable commodity that you ever exercise. I release you to be Jesus in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.